and welcome everyone to this session on the code quality advantage. So the reason I want to do this session is because I've been spending 30 years in the software industry, been writing a lot of code, work with lots of different companies and stakeholders. And one common theme that I noticed is that people during these 30 years have been telling me, no, no, we don't have time to refactor. No, we don't have time to automate tests. No, we don't have time to rethink our architecture. So we have this misconception in the industry that there is some kind of trade-off between speed and quality, right? That we need to sacrifice one to get the other. And what I want to show you today is that this is a myth. There is no such trade-off. In fact, we need both to go really, really quick. And we're going to cover a lot of ground over the next 40 minutes. And I like to approach this from the perspective of technical debt. So technical debt is something that you probably are all familiar with. You have probably heard the term before. What I think is so interesting is that technical debt has multiple root causes. We take it on for multiple reasons. And a typical case is that we try to sacrifice quality in order to move a little bit faster with a feature, right? So we cut some corners, we get a feature out in production, and everyone is happy in the short term. However, there are other reasons too that we take on technical debt. And one of the reasons might be that we actually do the right thing. We design our software properly, but then our understanding of the problem we're trying to solve changes, perhaps due to user feedback or our own experience. And this is what we typically call requirements change, right? And now our design is no longer a good fit. Or maybe, and of course, highly hypothetical in your case, maybe our design just wasn't a good fit to start with, right? No matter the root cause, the outcome is the same. We end up with code that is more expensive to maintain than it should be. And this is the definition of technical debt that I'm going to run with throughout this presentation. Now, during the past four to five years, we have learned a lot about the industry cost of bad code and technical debt in general. And there are multiple papers you can look at. I'm going to reference a few of them here. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter which paper you read because they have one thing in common. They all paint a pretty depressing view of our industry. Did you know that as developers, we waste somewhere between 23 to 42% of our work week dealing with the consequences of technical debt and bad code in general? 42% waste. What does that even mean? Let's do a small thought experiment together. So let's pretend that you have a company with 100 engineers. That means you need to pay the salaries for 100 people. With a 42% waste, it means you pay the salaries for 100 people, but you get the equivalent output of just 58 people. Does that sound like a good deal to you? No, of course not. It's horrible. And of course, there are other factors too. Because I like to claim that if you could actually build something with 58 people as opposed to 100, then doing it with a smaller team is always, always going to be more efficient. Because with a larger team, you have additional coordination costs, communication costs, and management overhead. So I actually think that the real waste from technical debt is significantly larger. I think these numbers are overly optimistic. Of course, technical debt and bad code is not only about financial impact. It's also about vulnerabilities. So another line of research has established that there is a strong correlation between software vulnerabilities and technical debt in the shape of various code smells that we're going to see throughout this presentation. So now, where does this leave us? Well, if we have something, technical debt, bad code, that uh, has some massive financial impact, waste for the 2% over time, and causes security vulnerabilities, we would expect technical debt to be at the very top of any decision maker's agenda. Is that what's happening? Well, probably not, because what again, what we see in the research field is that we do a horrible job as an industry. In fact, what researchers find is that we developers are frequently forced to introduce even more technical debt because companies just keep trading code quality for short-term gains like the next big feature. Now, I've, I've been thinking about this for a long time, for at least the past 10 years. Why do we do this trade-off? 
why do we sacrifice code quality over and over again to ship features? And I think I have an idea on one of the root causes. So let me show an example to you. I didn't bring any C sharp code in this slide. I decided to go a little bit more old school and present a piece of C++. But it doesn't really matter, right? Because I think as C-sharp developers, you're familiar with this structure. And I'd like to ask you a question. Looking at that code, can anyone tell me if this code is correct? Can anyone tell me what this code does? I have to admit that after all these years coding, and I even spent 10 years doing C++, I have absolutely no idea what this piece of code does. And I cannot tell if it's correct or not without spending a lot of time on it. Now, what I want to point out is that if we as developers struggle to understand code, we have to keep in mind that what you see on screen is just 19 lines of code. A modern system has hundreds of thousands, million lines of code that looks like just like that. And if we as developers struggle with understanding small pieces of code, imagine a non-technical stakeholder like a product person, a technical manager, a VP of engineering, a business manager, how should they understand if our code is good or bad, if there is technical debt or whether way is this? Software is largely a black box to many, many people. So what I'd like us to do today is to see, can we shine a light into this black box? Can we shine a light on technical debt and make it relevant to the business? In order to do this, I would like us to start to visualize technical debt and code quality. And to visualize something, we need to know what to visualize. So we need to know how to measure code quality. And this has been a notoriously hard problem. There have been multiple attempts throughout the decades, and you might have heard about approaches like cyclomatic complexity, Halstead's volume metrics, and so on. And what all of these metrics have in common is that they are pretty poor predictors of complexity. In fact, there's no real correlation between what these metrics find and something that's meaningful to the business. So one thing that uh, me and my team have been working on for the past six to seven years is to see, can we develop a better proxy for code quality? And we decided to call the concept code health. So code health is both a concept and a specific software metric that you can use. And it's a metric that's based on 25 different factors. Why 25 factors? Well, the reason is simple. It's very hard to agree on what makes good code good, right? It's very hard to define quality, but it's very easy to define what bad code is. So what we did is that we simply researched and came up with a list of 25 factors that we know are indicators of bad code. So the way this works is that you have a piece of code, might be C-sharp, might be Java or something else, and you parse that code. And then you just analyze that code for these different code smells. And I'm not going to show you the full list of the 25 factors. You're free to check it out uh, via the links, but I'm going to show you the most important ones. So at the top level, we look for um, module level smells. So these are like class design issues. And to give you a typical example of a class design issue or code smell at that level, that's low cohesion. So you might be familiar with low cohesion. It basically means that you have stuffed too many business responsibilities into the same class. So now this class has many, many reasons to change. And this is problematic because as a developer trying to understand that code, I now need to understand all these different business uh, rules in order to make sense of the code. It also opens up the risk for things like unexpected feature interactions, which are some of the worst bugs you can have. You know, you tweak some code over here and a completely unrelated feature breaks. That's usually caused by low cohesion. So low cohesion is a very serious smell. It obviously doesn't mean that we cannot make it even worse because what we can do is we can take a class with low cohesion and let it grow really, really large and let it include at least a brain method. I'm going to talk about that soon. What we have done now is that we have created a brain class. So that's another module level smell. And brain methods are a function level smell. It's something you might also know under its alias, GUD functions. What brain methods and GUD functions are, are simply large functions. They are always large and they tend to contain a lot of logic. And the reason they contain a lot of logic is because, again, they do too many things. They are, again, low on cohesion. 
So what this means to me as a developer is that the moment I want to modify anything inside this particular area of the code, I end up in the brain method. And each time I work on it, it becomes more and more complicated. So brain methods is a pretty severe code smell. Then finally, at the implementation level, we look for various uh, complexity patterns. And um, to mention a pattern with really high predictive power, I like to point out deep nested logic. So deep nested logic is something all of you have seen. It's when you have an if statement inside an if statement inside an if statement and maybe a loop for good measure. The reason that code is problematic is because there is some very good research that shows that roughly 20% of all programming mistakes are due to things like deep nested logic. And once we know about this, it's, it's pretty easy to avoid, right? So these are just some high level examples on uh, the 25 factors that you look for in code health. So you basically look for the presence of any of these factors in the code. And then uh, we have algorithms that can score, aggregate, and categorize every single piece of code as being in one of three categories. The code can either be green, that's healthy code with low risk. That's where you want to be with the majority of your source code. And then you have the next uh, category, yellow code. That's problematic code, where you have started to take on technical debt. And unless you're really careful, you might end up in the red category, which is unhealthy code. That's the type of code you never, ever want to work with, right? That's what typically called spaghetti code. It's code that's really hard to understand and very fragile, as we will soon see. So now that we know how we can use code health as a proxy for code quality, we can start to visualize code quality in large code bases. And I want to show how this can look on a real code base. So what you see on screen here is a code quality visualization of Ethereum. And there's really nothing special about Ethereum. Uh, it's just a good example of a mid-sized uh, code base. And Ethereum, for those of you who might not know it, is an open source uh, blockchain implementation. The interesting thing with this visualization is that it's based on code uh, written in 50 different Git repositories. So it's a multi-repo project. And you see that each one of these circles with the name, the ones I'm hovering over right now, they correspond to code in a specific Git repository. If this was a monorepo, then um, the top level circles would correspond to the top level folders in your repositories. We're going to see some examples on that soon as well. Anyway, uh, by using this visualization, I can quickly zoom in on the area I'm interested in, a typical an area where I do a lot of work or I might have an additional technical responsibility. So let's zoom in on research here. So when I zoom in on research, what I see is that it's a hierarchical structure. So we have the various subfolders inside that part of the code. And once I get to the lowest level of detail, I see that each file with source code is visualized as a circle. And you also see that these circles, they have different size. Some are big, some are much smaller. So the size of a circle just reflects the number of lines of code in that class. The important, uh, that's just to know how big a potential problem is, right? The interesting thing here is the color, which indicates the code health. So we see that on the top, we have one big red blob with red problematic code, and below it, we have two healthy pieces of code. So this makes it really, really easy to pinpoint the unhealthy problematic parts of your code. Now, I'm going to come back to what that means, but before I do that, I want to show you a few additional examples because I'm a big, big, big fan of visualizations. Because visualizations, they kind of tap into this amazing power detector that we carry around in our head, our visual brain, right? So by visualizing code, we can, within, you know, within a few seconds, we can start to draw conclusions and compare various code bases. And I want to show you an example. So to the left here, let's start with that one. That's a visualization of the code quality in React from Facebook. And React is a UI library that's super popular these days. Most of you are probably using it in one capacity or another. And when I look at React, I immediately see that the, the React reconciler, the part of the code that I've highlighted, seems to have some code quality problems. There's lots of yellow and red code inside it. So if this is a code base that I'm responsible for, then this is super important info to me, because as we will soon see, red and yellow code 
is going to constrain what we can do with the code base and its roadmap going forward. However, I can contrast React to the code base on the right. And this is our Microsoft code base. This is Core CLR. This is the runtime that you all use for .NET. And what's interesting with the Core CLR is that it's a massive, massive code base. What you see on screen is more than eight and a half million lines of code. So the reason I like this case study is because it kind of indicates that this visualization approach scales really well to large systems. So what can we say about the code quality? Well, we can immediately see that the, yeah, all the automated tests in the bottom left corner seem to be very healthy, right, with very few exceptions. But in the actual application code, we seem to have some really complicated pieces of code. You see this band of red code, right? It's like a Petri dish gone mad almost, right? And the question is, of course, what do I do with this information? How do I act upon this? And that's something I want to cover towards the end of the session. But before we do that, we need to connect this to some kind of business objective. Because if we use a code quality score and we don't connect it to something that's meaningful to the business, then code quality is always going to be a second priority, right? To really, really make it the business advantage it deserves to be, we need to be able to explain gains in code quality to business people. So two years ago, me and my research colleague, Dr. Marcus Borg, we set out to try to quantify the business impact of code quality. And we choose to do this on proprietary code bases because we wanted to make sure that this is data that's representative of what businesses work with. And we did this by connecting to 39 companies that uh, wanted to participate in the study. Each one of them had many, many different code products and code bases. These were large enterprises. And we made sure to include companies from many different industry segments because we wanted to make sure that whatever we find is general to the software industry as a whole. It's not something that's specific to one domain or one type of business. And for the same reason, we also made sure to include code in many different programming languages because we wanted to make sure that whatever we find is something that applies no matter what program language you use. Because products today are typically built in a polyglot fashion, right? So we had code written in C Sharp, of course, Java, C++, JavaScript, Python, and so on. And what I want to say before I show you the findings is that everything I want to show you is statistically significant meaning that it's very unlikely that our results are due to a fluke. There's probably a real effect behind it. And to guarantee that, we had um, our data published and peer-reviewed and presented at academic conferences. So what did we find? Is code quality important to a business? Well, let's see. I'm going to talk a bit about how we collected the data first. So. The first thing we did was to measure the time in development. And we wanted to compare that across the code of categories. So how do we know the time in development? Well, code quality is easy. We simply asked the companies that participated to run the tooling, which gave us a code health score for every single file in their code bases, right? So we had a massive table with that. But time in development is more tricky. What we didn't want to do was to force developers to self-report via some time spent field in JIRA or something like that, because if they would do that, two things would happen. First, they would hate us for having them do that, and that we didn't want. Second, it would be inaccurate, because they would basically just, you know, at the end of the week, we put in whatever we think in those fields. So we decided to automate it. So we connected to tools like Azure DevOps and JIRA, and uh, fetched information about the tickets when they started to work on them, when they were completed, and then we connected that to version control data so we can trace it down the time spent at the file level. So we basically calculated the cycle time for implementing features or fixing bug at the file level. So we now had a massive table with a known code health score and a known time in development. And that's what made it possible to calculate these statistics. So what do they tell us? Well, they tell us that if I have green code, I can move more than twice as quick compared to someone that has red code. Is this important to a business? Well, let's say that my company would have red code. And uh, 
let's say that we need to implement a new capability and it takes us two and a half months to do that. A competitor with green code can get the same thing in less than a month. It's going to be impossible to keep up. So green code is very clearly a productivity benefit to a business. You can get more things done than your competitors with poorer code of. However, what we also noticed in that study, we are well aware that averages can be a little bit misleading and the actual impact might be even larger. So to study that, we decided to look at the variation in task completion times. And what we found here was very dramatic. What we found was that the maximum time to implementing a ticket, be it a new feature or a bug fix, could vary up to nine times longer, 10 times longer for red code compared to green code. Because when we look at the actual numbers behind this, we see that the maximum time it takes to implement a ticket in green code is very, very close to the average. And that simply means that green code is predictable, right? It takes roughly the same time each time I work on it. There are no nasty surprises in the code. Whereas I can see that for red code, that relationship no longer holds true, right? It can take nine times longer. Is this relevant to a business? I would like to think so because what this represents is uncertainty. And if there's one thing I've learned through all these years in software, it's that uncertainty is something that no one, no one is comfortable with. So imagine your business manager promising something to uh, key stakeholders, maybe the company owners, maybe to the board, or maybe even to a customer that, yeah, we are building this feature now. We're going to launch it in one month. If they have read code, they can make no such promises because as we've seen the data, it can equally well take nine or 10 months and they're going to look really, really bad. Also, if I put on my developer hat, I'm also not a big fan of uncertainty because uncertainty is what's keeping me up late due to deadlines, missed deadlines, overtime and stress. So red code is disastrous on so many levels. Finally, what we also did in this study was that we had, uh, as we had access to Azure DevOps and Jira data, we could also figure out if the code was modified due to a new feature, some rework or due to a, a bug fix. And that made it possible to calculate defect densities. So how, what do you think, how do you think defects uh, differ across green, uh, yellow and red code? Well, let's have a look. And this is quite dramatic, isn't it? It turns out that red code has on average 15 times more defects than green code. So let me ask the obvious question. Is this relevant to your business? I definitely think so, because if we having red code would ship 15 times as many defects as someone having green code, then that would definitely impact the customer satisfaction and the product maturity experience. And for us as developers, red code is extremely stressful because all, because all these defects that we ship in, into production, they are going to come back in the shape of unplanned work where we have to context switch, right? So red code is really, really dangerous. Now, if we have this data and visualizations like this, how can we use them in our daily work? Well, let me share the things I have seen work really, really well and the things that I tend to do with this data. The first thing that I think is super useful is that if we have a visualization like this, we can use it to create situational awareness in our organization. But what I mean by that is that we can make sure that all stakeholders, be it engineers, developers, or product people, or managers, we can share the same understanding, the same view of where the strong and weak parts are in a code base. And that's a really, really good foundation because it helps us fight risk, right? Because let's take an example here. Let's say that the code base here to the right that I visualized, let's say that it's our code base, right? So maybe we sit down in a sprint planning meeting. Our product owner is attending. And our product owner tells us that uh, she has planned five major features in the React Reconciler part. Now, given what we know about uh, red and yellow code, we know that this is a massive risk. There's a large risk that we're going to um, need much more time than we plan for and that we are going to deliver with poor quality, many defects. So using this data, we can have a conversation. Would it make sense to first refactor the code so that we can safely implement all these features? 
And that brings me to the last use case, my personal favorite. And perhaps what I like the most about this type of data is that it makes it possible to finally build a business case for improvements and large scale refactorings, because these can now come with a business expectation. So based on the data, we can, we can give guarantees that if we have code like in the React Reconciler, if we take that red code, refactor it and make it healthy, then everything that we have planned in the roadmap for that particular component, we can now say that on average, we're going to be twice as quick with implementing those features. And we're going to significantly reduce the risk. We're going to have 15 times fewer defects on average. And that's a very, very quantifiable win. No, I still have a couple of minutes before uh, taking questions. So I wanted to take on one more related challenge. How do we prioritize remediations to large amounts of red code? So let's travel back to core CLR as an example. 8.5 million lines of code in total. If we just sum up the red code, we probably end up with two, two and a half million lines of code. How long would it take us to refactor two and a half million lines of code? Five years, 10 years? I don't know, but it's very clear that we would be long out of business before we even get there, right? Because as a business, we always need to balance improvements to existing code versus adding new features, right? It's a continuously changing space. So how can we do this? Well, this is where our set of techniques known as behavior code analysis can help. So for those of you who aren't familiar with behavior code analysis, the key idea here is that in our behavior code analysis, the code is important. It's really, really important to know if the code is healthy or not, right? So that's like the foundation. Once we have that, it's even more important to understand how we as developers interact with the system we're building. That's the behavior part of it. So it's an intersection between code and people. And to do a behavior code analysis, we obviously need some behavioral data on how we as developers work with the code. How can we possibly get such a thing? The good news are you all already have all the data you need. We might just not be used to think about it that way. What I'm referring to is version control data, Git. It turns out that Git is something we have used for years, more or less as an overly complicated backup system, occasionally maybe as a collaboration tool. But when doing so, we have built up this wonderful data source over how we as engineers have interacted with the code we're building. And there are many, many analyzes we can do from Git. I write about lots of them in my book. But one of my favorites, when it particularly when it comes to technical debt, is that Git data gives us a time dimension into our code. We can basically tell the story of how the system evolved, where we worked, how frequently we worked in various parts, and what happened over time. And this is something we can use to prioritize technical debt. So instead of showing you a video recording, I wanted to do a quick demo on how we can look on a real code base. And then I'm going to wrap up the presentation and take questions after that. So let's see, it's always interesting to do a live demo. Uh, you should be able to see my web browser now. And the system I'm analyzing is React from Facebook that we looked at before. And we can easily see that there are parts of the code that are unhealthy. I see like two modules, right? There's a pattern here. So to the left, I have something called benchmarks where there is plenty of unhealthy code. And to the right, I have the React Reconciler with unhealthy code. The question is, where do I start if I want to pay down technical debt and improve? The interesting thing here is that if we look at version control data, we can visualize that using a concept called hotspots. And I'm going to explain what that is. So if I click here on hotspots, what I do now is that I go to version control and I simply calculate how many commits have we done to every single piece of code here over the past year. And what I see now is that the more red it is, the higher the development frequency, right? The more commits we have done in that part of the code, the more relevant the code is. And what I see now might be surprising. I see that this benchmarks package where I had this red code is very stable. We haven't worked on it for years. So starting to fix some code down there 
won't have any big payoff, right? However, I see that there's a lot of development activity in the React Reconciler. So I would definitely zoom in here and see if these hotspots are unhealthy. So I, let me click on a hotspot and I immediately see that this is indeed unhealthy code. So what I have identified now is code that lacks in quality, poor quality code, that is also worked on all the time. And that's like the definition of technical debt with a high interest rate. So I want to show you how behavior code analysis techniques like a hotspot can help you separate the technical debt that you have to fix from the technical debt you can live with. And I want to clarify that with the slide because it's so important. So technical debt has two components. One is the actual loan you have taken on. And they, this is something you can measure by uh, code quality, right? Uh, red or green code. But the other is the interest. And if we look at this visualization, I have a slightly different view of this code base. So on the x-axis, you have each file with source code, and they are sorted according to the change frequency. That is how many commits have I done to each piece of code. That's what I see on the y-axis. And if I look at this visualization, I see that it forms a power law shape. And this is something I've seen in every single code base I've ever analyzed. And I probably analyzed three, 400 code bases by now. So this seems to be the way software evolves. And this is important to us. And it's actually good news. Because what this means is that most of our code is going to be in the long tail. So this is code that's rarely, if ever, touched. And if we have some yellow or red code down there, then that's technical debt. We want to be aware of it, but we can probably live with it because the interest is so low. On the other hand, we see that most development activity is at the head of this power law curve. So that means that in a hotspot, we cannot afford any technical debt at all. That's the code we really, really need to keep green. Because if we fail to do so, the costs of that technical debt are going to explode due to the high development frequency of the code, right? So it's a very high interest on that technical debt. And what I see in our research is that uh, the hotspots tend to make up a very small part of the code base, maybe just two, three, four percent but attract an unproportionally large part of the development activity. So starting to pay down technical debt in a hotspot is likely to give you a very big short-term benefit as well. And with that, I've come to the end of my presentation. What I wanted to show you today is that to really, really uh, make code quality or competitive advantage, you need to have two different dimensions. One is the quality dimension that you can measure with code health we see if the code is good or bad. And the other is the relevance dimension that you can measure with hotspots. So that is how we know the impact and priorities of any code quality findings. And I started out saying that um, there seems to be this conception in industry that there is a trade-off between speed and quality. But what we see in our research, in our data, is that the opposite seems to be true. And I like to think that with 15 times fewer defects, twice the development speed and nine times lower uncertainty in completion times for tasks, the business advantage of code quality should be really, really clear. And if you want to know more about this, then I have a number of resources for you here. Uh, the links will take you to a white paper that summarizes uh, the key uh, code health findings that I talked about, the business impact. There's also an actual research paper behind it. So if you want to go into all the details and figure out that hey, how did they measure this or how did they control for this bias, then the research paper is your friend. And uh, to do the actual research and to visualize it, I'm using uh, the CodeSyn tool uh, where I work. So if you're interested in trying this out on your own code base, then I highly encourage you to give it a shot. I think you will find it interesting to see what your code looks like. And you can go to codesyn.com and just test it out for free. And finally, if you want to dive deeper into behavior code analysis, then you could probably do worse than reading the second edition of Your Code is Crime Scene. It's a brand new second edition that goes into code quality, hotspots, and many, many other things around successful software. With that said, I'd like to thank you a lot for listening to me, and I'm very much looking forward to the questions. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.